Hello, and welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So, if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. This episode's conversation is about the novel To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. And I'm joined by our Novel Conversations readers, Elizabeth Flood and Katie Smith. Elizabeth, Katie, welcome. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Glad to be here. Glad to have you both here. Before we get started, I want to give you a quick intro for To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Published in 1927, To the Lighthouse centers on the Ramsey family and their visits to the Isle of Skye in Scotland between 1910 and 1920. Following and extending the tradition of modernist novels like Marcel Proust and James Joyce, the plot of To the Lighthouse is secondary to its philosophical introspection. The novel includes little dialogue and almost no direct action. Most of it is written as thoughts and observations. To the Lighthouse is made up of three powerfully charged visions into the life of the Ramsay family, living in a summer house off the rocky coast of Scotland. There's maternal Mrs. Ramsay, the highbrow Mr. Ramsay, their eight children, and assorted holiday guests. From Mr. Ramsay's seemingly trivial postponement of a visit to a nearby lighthouse, Virginia Woolf examines tensions and allegiances and shows that the small joys and quiet tragedies of everyday life could go on forever. The novel recalls childhood emotions and highlights adult relationships. Katie, Elizabeth, you both know we usually start our conversations by introducing the main characters, but today I would like to start with the style and the structure of the novel. As I mentioned, the novel is divided into three sections, The Window, Time Passes, and The Lighthouse. And each segment is fragmented into stream of consciousness or interior monologue contributions from various narrators, using their point of view. As you said, not much actual action in the first chapters. The novel includes little dialogue and almost no direct action. Most of it is written as thoughts and observations. The characters take walks, read a little, and talk to each other and about each other a lot. And then there are lots of kids. And guests and local friends and even a painter. And we're introduced to the characters, but only briefly, almost impressionistically. Just very brief glimpses as they walk and talk and interact. That's a great point. And really, the first 19 chapters of the first section, The Window, are just that, a window into the thinking and emotions of the characters that we meet. From their thoughts about themselves and about each other. Did this style of writing, this use of more interior thoughts, make the novel easier or harder to read? Katie? I really enjoy reading Stream of Consciousness. Uh, for me, it flows really easily, and it's not too complicated. So it worked for you. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, how about you? I wouldn't say it was difficult, although I think at some point it could get a little bit tedious, but definitely an interesting style of writing. All right, well, let's quickly talk about the setting of the novel. Obviously, there will be a lighthouse, but where are we, Katie? We're in the Hebrides, which is a group of islands west of Scotland. Across the bay from their house stands a large lighthouse. Our main characters, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsay, bring their eight children to the summer home, uh, six-year-old James Ramsey wants desperately to go to the lighthouse. And Elizabeth, when are we? The first section, The Window, opens just before the start of World War I. All right, well, with that quick start, let's take a break here, and when we come back, we'll introduce our characters and talk about them some as we continue to unravel to the lighthouse. You're listening to Novel Conversations. We'll be right back. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Sheree Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures. Welcome back. All right, Katie, Elizabeth, when we left, we wanted to start introducing our characters. The first person we meet is Mrs. Ramsey. Who is she? And oh, by the way, what's her first name? We are never given a first name for either Mr. or Mrs. Ramsey. 
A beautiful and loving woman, Mrs. Ramsey is a wonderful hostess who takes pride in making memorable experiences for the guests at the family's summer home on the Isle of Skye with her husband and their eight children. Six-year-old James Ramsey, the youngest, wants desperately to go to the lighthouse, and Mrs. Ramsey tells him that they will go the next day if the weather permits. But Mr. Ramsey tells him coldly that the weather looks to be foul. James resents his father and believes that he enjoys being cruel to James and his siblings. It did feel a little cruel when he said, no, you're not going. But tell me a little bit about Mr. Ramsey, Elizabeth. He is a prominent metaphysical philosopher. Mr. Ramsey loves his family, but often acts like something of a tyrant. He tends to be selfish and harsh due to his persistent personal and professional anxieties. Well, what's he anxious about? More than anything, that his book is insignificant in the grand scheme of things and that he will not be remembered by future generations. Well, he says even a rock will outlive Shakespeare. He Hmm. shouldn't be surprised that his work will be outlived. Yeah, he does seem to have an axe to grind with Shakespeare quite a bit. (laughs) He does. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe a little jealous. (laughs) Well, the Ramses host a number of guests, including the dour Charles Stansley, who admires Mr. Ramses' work as a metaphysical philosopher. Katie, can you describe Tansley briefly? He is a young philosopher. He's a pupil of Mr. Ramsey who stays with the Ramseys on the Isle of Skye. Also at the house is Lily Briscoe, a young painter who begins a portrait of Mrs. Ramsey. Mrs. Ramsey wants Lily to marry William Banks, an old friend of the Ramseys, but Lily resolves to remain single. And who is William Banks? He's a botanist and an old friend of the Ramseys who stays on the Isle of Skye. Banks is a kind of mellow man whom Mrs. Ramsey hopes will marry Lily Briscoe. Although he never marries her, Banks and Lily do remain close friends. And Lily is a painter, but do we know anything more about her? Well, Lily is in her mid-30s, which at the time probably was a bit unusual to be unmarried at that age. She has befriended the Ramses on the Isle of Skye and rents a room in the village near William Banks. And like Mr. Ramsey, Lily is plagued by fears that her work lacks worth and long-term value. And she begins a portrait of Mrs. Ramsey at the beginning of the novel, but has trouble finishing it. Well, after lunch, Mrs. Ramsey invites Tansley to accompany her on an errand into town, and he accepts. On their way out, she stops to ask Augustus Carmichael, an elderly poet also staying with the Ramseys, if he needs anything, but he responds that he does not. On the way into town, Mrs. Ramsey tells Carmichael's story. Elizabeth, what is that little story? He was once a promising poet and intellectual, but he made an unfortunate marriage. But Mrs. Ramsey's confidence flatters Tansley, and he rambles incessantly about his work. Tansley has a bit of a crush on Mrs. Ramsey, doesn't he? Who doesn't? (laughs) (laughs) That's right. That's true. And we'll talk about a few of the other men who have crushes on her as well. As they're taking their walk into town, the two of them pass a sign advertising a circus. And Mrs. Ramsey suggests that they all go. Hesitant, though, Tensley explains to Mrs. Ramsey that, having grown up in an impoverished family, he was never taken to a circus. Mrs. Ramsey reflects that Tansley harbors a deep insecurity regarding his humble background and that this insecurity causes much of his unpleasantness. Mrs. Ramsey now feels more kindly toward him, but his self-centered talk continues to bore her. Tansley, however, thinks that Mrs. Ramsey is the most beautiful woman he has ever seen. Like most of the male guests, he is a little in love with her and Even the chance to carry her bag thrills him. Later, during the course of the afternoon, while she is with her son, James, Mr. Ramsey approaches his wife. He is petulant and needs reassurance. Recognizing his need to be assured of his genius, she tells him that Tansley considers him the greatest living philosopher. Eventually, she restores his confidence, and he goes off to watch the children play cricket. And all through this time, young James senses his father's presence and hates him. Discerning his father's need for sympathy, he wishes his father would leave him alone with his mother. Mrs. Ramsey returns to the story that she is reading to James. Inwardly, she reflects anxiously that people observing her interactions with Mr. Ramsey might infer that her husband depends on her excessively and think mistakenly that her contributions to the world surpass his. And actually kind of does. There's a lot of weak men in this story propped up by very strong women, but I think we'll get to that a little bit later. This is a moment where this style of telling the story really works. We understand her feelings from her thoughts, her interior monologue with herself. And then Augustus Carmichael, the old poet, he shuffles by. And she thinks, Carmichael, 
he took opium. Wait, wait, just like that? An opium addict? Yes, and he ignores her, hurting her feelings and her pride. She realizes, however, that her kindness is petty because she expects to receive gratitude and admiration from those she treats with sympathy and generosity. And I'll mention it just once again. We know that because we're privy to her thoughts. And then we get some thoughts from Banks. William Banks considers Mr. Ramsey's behavior and concludes that it is a pity that his old friend cannot act more conventionally. He suggests to Lily, who stands beside him putting away her paint and brushes, that their host is something of a hypocrite. But Lily disagrees with him. Though she finds Mr. Ramsey narrow and self-absorbed, she also observes the sincerity with which he seeks admiration. Lily is about to speak and criticize Mrs. Ramsey, but Banks' rapture of watching Mrs. Ramsey silences her. As he stares at Mrs. Ramsey, it is obvious to Lily that he is in love. As we said, everyone loves Mrs. Ramsey. Tell me a little bit more about Banks. Banks, who once enjoyed a close relationship with Mr. Ramsey, now feels somewhat removed from him. He cannot understand why Mr. Ramsey needs so much attention and praise. Meanwhile, she finishes reading James' his story, and the nursemaid takes him to bed. Mrs. Ramsey is certain that he is thinking of their thwarted trip to the lighthouse and that he will remember not being able to go for the rest of his life. From a distance, Mr. Ramsey sees her and notices her sadness and beauty. He wants to protect her, but hesitates, feeling helpless and reflecting that his temper causes her grief. He resolves not to interrupt her, but soon enough, sensing his desire to protect her, Mrs. Ramsey calls after him, takes up her shawl, and meets him on the lawn. Just again, one more moment where it's Mrs. Ramsey who seems to have to take care of Mr. Ramsey. And then as fathers and mothers do, while they walk together, they talk about their children. Mrs. Ramsey brings up to Mr. Ramsey her worries about their son Jasper's proclivity for shooting birds and her disagreement with Mr. Ramsey's high opinion of Charles Tansley. She complains about Tansley's bullying and excessive discussion of his dissertation. But Mr. Ramsey counters that his dissertation is all that Tansley has in his life. He does add that he would disinherit his daughter Prue if she married Tansley, however. Mr. Ramsey mourns that the best and most productive period of his career is over, but he chastises himself for his sadness, thinking that his wife and his eight children are, in their own way, a fine contribution to the poor little universe. Her husband and his moods amaze Mrs. Ramsey, who realizes that he believes that his books would have been better had he not had children. She wonders if he notices the ordinary things in life, such as the view or the flowers. Then Lily comes into view with William Banks, and Mrs. Ramsey decides that the couple must marry. And while all this is going on, mostly in Mrs. Ramsey's head, she also wonders about another match she's been working on. Tell me a little bit about Paul and Minta. Paul Rayleigh is a young friend of the Ramseys who visits them on the Isle of Skye. Paul is a kind, impressionable young man who follows Mrs. Ramsey's wishes in marrying Minta Doyle. Minta Doyle is a flighty young woman who also visits at the Ramseys on the Isle of Skye. And how goes that match? Paul thinks to himself that this is the most difficult day of his life. So not well. No, not <laughs> well. And we'll circle back to them later on in the book. And finally, for the evening, there's a dinner scene, and that's pretty much the final scene of our first section. Most of the characters are here, and the day moves from chaos to blissful, though momentary, order. It kind of starts as a disaster. Minta, Paul, Andrew, Nancy, they're all running late from the beach. But as we continue to read this scene, a change comes over the group as the candles are lit and the food's brought out. The guests come together against this chaos, and for the remainder of the dinner at least, there's a bit of unity. Despite all the tensions and imperfections evident in the Ramsey household— such as Mr. Ramsey's sometimes ridiculous vanity and Mrs. Ramsey's determination to counter the flaws in her own marriage by arranging marriages for her friends, the tone of the window remains primarily bright and optimistic. The pleasant beach, the lively children, and the Ramsey's generally loving marriage gives us a feeling of possibility and potential, and many of the characters have happy prospects. Paul and Minta anticipate their marriage, and Mrs. Ramsey comforts herself with her daughter Prue's future marriage, as well as her son Andrew's accomplished career as a mathematician. And then, just as the first section, The Window, provided us a window, a look into the thoughts and thinking and lives of our characters, we start the second section of this book, and the section is just as clear. Time passes, and the time does pass. It starts with one night, the darkness comes, and one night becomes another night. And darkness floods the house, 
The furniture and the people seem to disappear completely. The wind creeps indoors and is the only movement. The air plays across objects of the house, wallpaper, books, flowers. It creeps up the stairs and continues on its way. And in the darkness of one night, at the end of chapter three, comes these lines. Mr. Ramsey, stumbling across the passage one dark morning, stretched his arm out, but Mrs. Ramsey, having died rather suddenly the night before, his arms, though stretched out, remained empty. And the novel continues, and time continues to pass. The contents of the house are packed and stored, the winds enter, and without the resistance of lives being lived, begins to nibble at their possessions. As it moves across these things, the wind asks, Will you fade? Will you perish? The objects answer, We remain, and the house is peaceful. Only Mrs. McNabb, the housekeeper, disturbs the peace as she arrives to dust the bedrooms. Mrs. McNabb makes her way through the house. She is old and weary and hums a tune that bears little resemblance to the joyous song of 20 years earlier. As she cleans the house, she wonders, how long will it all endure? Some pleasant memory occurs to the old woman, which makes her job more pleasant. And time passes. It's spring again. But time passes. Prue Ramsey marries, and people comment on her great beauty. Summer approaches, and Prue dies from an illness connected with childbirth. Flies and weeds make a home in the Ramsey's summer house. And to our listeners, it may sound abrupt that Prue marries and then dies in childbirth, but it's just that abrupt in our novel. As we're reading it, we learn Prue Ramsey's married, and then we quickly learn Prue Ramsey is dead. And similarly, Andrew Ramsey is killed in France during World War I. Augustus Carmichael publishes a volume of poetry during the war that greatly enhances his reputation. And Mrs. McNabb, the housekeeper, hearing a rumor that the family will never return, picks a bunch of flowers from the garden to take home with her. The house is sinking quickly into disrepair. The books are moldy. Oh, that's a, that hurts my heart. <laughs> Mrs. McNabb has little hope that the family will return or that the house will survive. And she thinks that keeping it up is just too much work for one old woman. During the night, only the beam of the lighthouse pierces the darkness of the house. At last, once the war is over, Mrs. McNabb leads an effort to clean up the house, rescuing its objects from oblivion. She and a woman named Mrs. Bast battle the effects of time, and eventually, after much labor, get the house back in order. Ten years have passed. Ten years? Indeed. The Ramseys are expecting to come back to the house just as it was before. But Elizabeth, before the Ramseys get back to the house, Lily Briscoe shows up. Lily arrives at the house on an evening in September. I see this section, Time Passes, as a metaphor for the Ramsey family. Right. It brings to the Ramsey's destruction as vast as that inflicted on Europe by World War I. When the Ramseys return to their summer home shaken, depleted, and unsure, they represent the post-war state of the entire continent. All right, let's take a break here, and when we come back, we'll talk about the final section of our novel, The Lighthouse. You're listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. We'll be right back. Hi, listeners. My name's Ray Suarez, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you about another podcast from Evergreen Podcasts, The Things I Thought About When My Body Was Trying to Kill Me. In this podcast, I share with you a personal story over the several months where I had to think hard about the end. Join me, Ray Suarez, as I journey through this battle with cancer on my new podcast. Listen to The Things I Thought About when my body was trying to kill me by following us on your favorite podcast app today. Welcome back. All right, when we left, uh, 10 years had passed, and the final section of our novel begins, The Lighthouse. In this third section, we're finally going to get to The Lighthouse. Mr. Ramsey is going to the lighthouse with his son James and his daughter Cam. It starts with Lily sitting at breakfast, wondering what her feelings mean, returning after 10 years now that Mrs. Ramsey is dead. She suddenly remembers a painting she had been working on years ago during her last stay at the Ramseys. And she decides that she will finish the painting now. She heads outside and sets up her easel on the lawn. 
Upon her arrival the previous night, she was unable to assuage Mr. Ramsey's need for sympathy, and she fears his interference with her current project. Right. She sets a clean canvas on the easel, but she cannot see the shapes or colors that surround her because she feels Mr. Ramsey bearing down on her. She thinks angrily that all Mr. Ramsey knows how to do is take, while all Mrs. Ramsey did was give. And Mr. Ramsey watches Lily, observing her to be shriveled slightly, but not unattractive. He asks if she has everything she needs, and she assures him that she does. Cam and James appear for the sojourn to the lighthouse. They are cold and unpleasant to their father. And as the boat sails toward the lighthouse, both James and Cam feel their father's mounting anxiety and impatience. Mr. Ramsey mutters and speaks sharply to the McAllister's boy, a fisherman's son who is rowing his boat. Bound together against what they perceive to be their father's tyranny, the children resolve to make the journey in silence. They secretly hope that the wind will never rise and that they will be forced to turn back. But as they sail farther out, the sails pick up the wind and the boat speeds along. James steers the boat and mans the sail, knowing that his father will criticize him if he makes the slightest mistake. And it's at this moment that we get some shifts in the youngster's thinking. Mr. Ramsey talks to McAllister about a storm that sank a number of ships near the lighthouse on Christmas. Cam realizes that her father likes to hear stories of men having dangerous adventures and thinks that he would have helped the rescue effort had he been on the island at the time. She is proud of him, but also, out of loyalty to James, means to resist his oppressive behavior. And Cam continues in her thoughts, They don't feel a thing there, thinking of the people who are still on the shore. Her mind moves in swirls and waves like the sea, until the wind slows and the boat comes to a stop between the lighthouse and the shore. Mr. Ramsey sits on the boat reading a book, and James waits with dread for the moment that his father will turn to him with some criticism. James realizes that he now hates and wants to kill not his father, but the moods, that descend on his father. He likens the dark sarcasm that makes his father intolerable to a wheel that runs over the foot and crushes it. In other words, Mr. Ramsey is as much a victim of these spells of tyranny as James and Cam. Oh, it sounds like our boy is growing up and maybe getting a little sense. He remembers his father telling him 10 years ago that he would not be able to go to the lighthouse. Then, the lighthouse was silvery and misty. Now, when he is much closer to it, it looks starker. James is astonished at how little his present view of the scene resembles his former image of it, but he reflects that nothing is ever only one thing. Both images of the lighthouse are true. Again, perception is perspective. He remembers his mother, who left him sitting with the Army and Navy stores catalog after Mr. Ramsey dismissed their initial trip to the lighthouse. Mrs. Ramsey remains a source of everlasting attraction to James for he believes she spoke the truth and said exactly what came into her head. Cam also feels liberated from her father's anger and her brother's expectations. She feels overjoyed at having escaped the burden of these things. And back on shore, even Lily is having some changing thoughts. Watching the sailboat approach the lighthouse, she contemplates distance as crucially important to one's understanding of other people. As Mr. Ramsey recedes into the horizon, he begins to seem to her a different person altogether. And once again, Wolf forces us to weigh and judge their various perceptions. For them, a change in perspective is a change in thinking, a change in attitude. Similarly, Lily's understanding of Mrs. Ramsey has changed considerably since Mrs. Ramsey's death. Lily thinks about the people she once knew at this house, about Carmichael's poetry, and about Charles Tansley. She thinks that people interpret one another in ways that reflect their own needs. To see someone clearly and fully, she concludes, one would need more than 50 pairs of eyes. And back on the boat, Mr. Ramsey is almost finished with his book. The sight of the lighthouse inspires James to recognize the profound loneliness that both he and his father feel. James lands the boat, and Mr. Ramsey praises James' sailing. Cam thinks that James has gotten what he has always wanted, his father's praise. But James, unwilling to share his pleasure, acts sullen and indifferent. What a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the shore, Lily declares aloud that her painting is finished and notes that Mr. Ramsey must have reached the lighthouse by now. Carmichael rises up and looks at the sea, agreeing that the sailboat must have reached the destination. Lily draws a final line on her painting and realizes that it is truly finished. She realizes that she does not care whether it will be hung in attics or destroyed, 
for she has had her vision, an understanding that Mr. Ramsey never came to about his own work. And with these changes in perspective, with this new wisdom that comes with age and experience and contemplation and distance, our story essentially ends right there. All right, so now let's take a final break and then head into our last segment where I'd like to ask the two of you to share a moment or a character or a quote that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. Right now, you're listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. We'll be right back. My name's Adam Sokol, and I'm the host of the Passions and Prologues podcast. Every week, best-selling authors like Jenny Jackson, Rebecca Mackay, Lisa Scottolini, or Brad Meltzer come on to my show to talk about, yes, their new books, but more importantly, the things that they're crazy passionate about. We've talked about the Muppets, powerlifting, traveling, gardening, home improvement, and so much more. We dig into why these things are their passions, how they inspire their writing, and where they came to fall in love with these random assorted things. Be sure to subscribe to the Passions and Prologues podcast wherever you get your podcasts and check out evergreenpodcast.com to learn more. And welcome back. Elizabeth, Katie, before our break, we ended our story. And now I'd like to ask the two of you to share a moment or a character or maybe a quote that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. Elizabeth, do you have something for us? Yes, I did want to talk about Mrs. Ramsey's view of marriage versus Lily Briscoe's view of marriage. Mrs. Ramsey really has a power of influencing other people, and she believes marriage is the best thing for everybody. And so she influences other people with her matchmaking. So she is the reason that Paul proposes to Minta because that's what Mrs. Ramsey thinks is best. Even if it's the worst day of his life. Yes. And it ends up, you know, 10 years later when Lily goes to visit Paul and Minta that they are not happy together. So perhaps Mrs. Ramsey pushing Paul into marrying Minta was not the best thing for them. And additionally, unfortunately, Prue's marriage was what caused her untimely death. And isn't that really part of where this novel is coming from? I think Virginia Woolf wanted to discuss or wanted us to think about the changing roles of women, especially during this time. It was very traditional for a woman to get married at a very young age and have a lot of children. Lily is changing that. She's a woman of her time now. And she doesn't necessarily feel that she has to get married to support a man, to have a man take care of her. The times they are are changing. Katie, did you have something you wanted to share? Well, in part three, when Lily is uh, painting her portrait of Mrs. Ramsey, every character is described with a different color. And I thought that that was really interesting to bring in the action of painting into the descriptions that Wolf is placing in front of us. I did like that technique. But she never uses purple because in her first painting she did, Mrs. Ramsey was painted in purple. Ah, very good. I really like the character of Augustus Carmichael, the opium-using poet. First of all, he reads Virgil, Rome's greatest epic poet, Mm -hmm. and he serves to reinforce Mr. Ramsey's biggest fear. Fame is not only temporary and fleeting, but it's mercurial, it's unfair. He survives the war, his work is greatly enhanced, he gets the fame that Mr. Ramsey had craved. Elizabeth, did you have anything else? Yes, Mrs. Ramsey, towards the end of that first day, is reflecting on how she wishes that none of her children would grow any older. She wants to keep especially her youngest children at the age they are right now forever. And she reflects to herself that this is the happiest they will ever be in their lives. And Mr. Ramsey thinks she's being pessimistic, but it turns out that Mrs. Ramsey is right. You know, later on, as the children grow older, tragedy strikes. Andrew dies young. Prue dies young. She dies suddenly. And the whole family is really tragedy stricken 10 years later. Well, Elizabeth, do you think part of her not wanting her children to grow up is because she didn't want to lose her role in their lives, their mother? Certainly as children get older, we still love our moms, but we don't need them as much. Is that part of her concern, do you think? Yes, I think so. I mean, her other children were already growing older, and she wasn't going to have any more little children after them. So I think she was really treasuring her last years of having really young children. 
Okay, good. Uh, Katie, did you have another one you wanted to share with us? This is a quick moment that happened uh, at the end of dinner in part one. Mr. Ramsey is reciting poetry to the table, and it's kind of the, the final moment of dinner. They kind of walk out on this note on Mrs. Ramsey. But the poem they're reading is by Leonard Wolf, who's Virginia's husband. Oh, so Virginia did marry then. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and she, I believe she has a couple of children, two or three, if I mm-hmm. remember what I was reading at one point. But I think a lot of this book is Virginia Woolf's speculation at a woman's role and what is marriage and should she just be a mother and aloof and not book smart because obviously Virginia Woolf doesn't feel that way. Mm-hmm. But then she still brings her husband into it. And I think that's kind of saying that he is important to her life too. Yeah. Well, I think throughout this whole novel, Virginia Woolf gives us that image of, of the women. They use their strength to shore up, to strengthen the men. It's the men who need the reassuring. It's the men who need the hugs. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and it's the women's strength that they give to the men that, props up these men, I'm going to say the word again, that that the men apparently need. Virginia Woolf is telling us the strength for these men came from their women. The women are the ones with the strength. Right. I think she's making a clear point there for womanhood, if if I can use that that term. Right. Mr. Ramsey goes to Lily in the last section for that sympathy, that he he's just dying for somebody to give him attention and care for him. And I, when Lily first showed up at the house in part three, I was wondering why did she go? Who invited her? <laughs> what purpose is she there for? And I think she might be wondering why she went too. Right. But it's because Mr. Ramsey needs her. Exactly. But she doesn't give him that sympathy. Because again, for Virginia Woolf, Lily Briscoe is a woman of her time and, and women's roles are changing. Mm-hmm. All right. You know, I think that's a great way to end our discussion on the novel. To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Elizabeth, Katie, I do want to thank both of you for coming in and having this conversation with me today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We did. Thank you so much, Frank. Thanks for having us, Frank. I'm Frank Lavallo, and you've been listening to Novel Conversations. Thanks for listening to Novel Conversations. If you're enjoying the show, please give us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find us on Instagram or Twitter at Novel Conversations. Follow us to stay up to date on upcoming episodes and anything else we've got in the works. I want to give special thanks to our readers today, Elizabeth Flood and Katie Smith. Our sound designer and producer is Noah Fouts, and Grace Sienna Longfellow is our audio engineer. Our executive producers are Michael D'Aloya and David Allen Moss. I'm Frank Lavallo, and thank you for listening. I hope you soon find yourself in a novel conversation all your own. Hi, listeners. My name's Ray Suarez, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you about another podcast from Evergreen Podcasts, The Things I Thought About When My Body Was Trying to Kill Me. In this podcast, I share with you a personal story over the several months where I had to think hard about the end. Join me, Ray Suarez, as I journey through this battle with cancer on my new podcast. Listen to The Things I Thought About When My Body Was Trying to Kill Me by following us on your favorite podcast app today. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.